Thank you for joining me today on Side by Side, and I hope you've got your boots on for a bit of further walking through this little epistle. It might get tough going, as I said, sometimes, but that's okay. There are parts of the Bible that are harder than others, and words that are used and phrases that are not normally in our conversation. And we're going to come across one of those words today. And forgive me, it's a big word, but what can I do? That's the word it is, and we'll try to explain it. It's found in these verses, chapter 3, 24 and 25, which says that we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, through whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now, that contains a most important truth And I dare say that if a person only ever understood that in the whole Bible, that might be the most important thing of all. What do we mean by that? Well, this phrase talks about propitiation, which is really the word wrath. It's to to placate or to appease the wrath of another. And the idea of someone being very, very angry is indeed, uh, I suspect, it's something we don't even like to think about, and especially in terms of God, because we think of God being loving and kind and so on. And so when people say, well, is God really angry? Is he really wrathful? I don't like the thought of an angry God. Well, if God was not angry at sin, I would be concerned. Like take, for example, now, if you have somebody who does something to you or to somebody you love, they hurt them, they sin against them in a, in a grievous way, would you be wrong to be angry about that? If you weren't angry about that, you would be wrong. Now, what you do about your anger, that's a very different thing. What does God do with his anger? God pours out his anger on his own self, his own son, rather than on those who trust him. Hmm. That's why this is one of the most precious parts of Scripture. Funny, I just had a phone call from a friend this morning and it reminded me of an occasion. It was about fencing and hedges and so on. And we were chatting and and it reminded me of an occasion whenever I asked a contractor to cut a hedge and he cut a little bit more than was the the right amount. He cut my neighbor's hedge as well, which which was very painful. And I felt very embarrassed about it. And, And what can you do? You can't put it back onto the, you can't, I mean, it's cut, it's cut. It's going to take some time to grow. Well, I did experience that day the just wrath of my neighbor. He, or the phone line was very, was very hot, that's all I can say. And I, you know, I was, what could I say? I just say he was right. It ended up in a court case, sadly, which was compensation at the end of the day. And that was the way that that was dealt with. But the wrath, I don't think, was ever fully dealt with, which is sad, although he and I developed at least a working relationship in the future. But isn't this the sort of thing that we find so hard, this idea of wrath. And I know I feel uncomfortable with it until I understand the nature of God is perfection and when he deals with something, he deals with it in a perfect way. Now, whenever you look at the wrath that other societies and pastimes people have tried to appease in their various gods, we can see how it's a very different thing But it's been part and partial of life, which is interesting. It says something about human nature that that we feel we need to somehow appease these gods. So when other cultures who believe in multiple gods, many gods, they would feel the need to appease the god, to keep the god happy because things they know are not right. So they offer up sacrifices. They offer up sacrifices of food and, and bits and pieces. Sometimes they've offered up sacrifices of humans. And we know that has gone on. We know that happened in the Canaanite world. They offered up children's sacrifices. It was one of the reasons why God judged that nation. But what's different in the Bible is that God isn't asking you to offer a sacrifice. He is offering himself as a sacrifice. In fact, the whole system of sacrifice in the Old Testament was to give the people a solution to deal with this. In Leviticus, he says, I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. God gave it. He doesn't ask you to give it. God gave it to us. And so here you read again in this verse, those words there that it was that God put forward 
Jesus as a propitiation. He put him forward. In other words, God took the initiative. God chose to send his own son, his own self, because God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, so that he put himself out there. And the source of this, why does he do this? He does this because he loves us. That's why he does it. God, and I quote here, God does not love us because Christ died for us. Christ died for us because God loves us. These are things, these are truths that when you start to think about them, they are so important and so life-changing. For you and I to think that our salvation and our future eternal security, which is the greatest need in our whole lives, that's more important than anything else we will ever have to consider. But when we realize upon which and what it rests, then we are able to have an assurance that is transformative. Do you want merely to be assured simply because you said, well, I I felt, felt good, I prayed a prayer, and because of the prayer, I think God will accept me? No. God doesn't accept you because you prayed a prayer. He doesn't accept me because I prayed a prayer. He accepts me because Jesus Christ bore his wrath. Now, what my prayer was doing was the expression of faith, and that's what this verse says. This verse says that then to be received by faith. And all my prayer was doing was receiving. My prayer was open hands, as it were. And and what part do open hands have? Merely to receive. But it is important to receive, very important to receive. Because by receiving this, you and I are acknowledging, number one, that it was needed, it was necessary. I was justifiably directly in the line of God's wrath because I had offended him. I'm the one who had cut down, as it were, his hedge. I had destroyed everything by my sinful life between us. So it was necessary, and I recognize that. But I also recognize that it is available to me, to me. Yes, and that is wonderful. Yes, even I, even I, no matter what my life has been, no matter how low my life has dipped and stooped, even I, I can be the recipient of this great gift. And so because of these things, That's why this is, maybe we go slowly at times like this, on this holy ground. And we begin to see the work of Jesus Christ for us in in a new way. He stands between us and the judgment of God. He has taken the judgment of God for us. And now God looks on you and I with the favour and love and mercy. And that's a wonderful blessing to know that. And to know that he will always do that. Even on your worst day, even on my worst day, he is looking on me with favour. Those days that that I make so many mistakes again and again. He's saying, I know John, but you are my child. My son has borne the wrath. I was interested that one of the hymns, the great hymns in Christ alone, speaks about the wrath of God. There was a publisher in the USA that wanted to take that hymn and take out the wrath of God statement from it. They didn't like it. Do you know that's an alternative a person can do in this? They can either say, I don't like this idea of the wrath of God, so I'm going to change it. Or they can acknowledge that God is justly right to be angry towards my sin and elevate and glorify him by keeping that truth in there and acknowledging what Jesus has done. So. I just pray that you will maybe understand this a little bit and a little bit more and that we will understand it more so that our worship and our delight in God and our just our treasuring of everything that that he has done for us will deepen. And then flowing out from that, our willingness to enjoy him and trust him because doing what he says is another way of trusting him. Trust his word, trust his wisdom, trust his guidance, trust his direction, and run to do it, whatever it is he tells you to do, in his word then, because he's your good, good father. And isn't it great to have such a good father? Praise him, bless him, and have a good day today.